the date today is uh, June 24th, 2014, and we are uh, here to uh, interview Dr. D. James Moray uh, at uh, 1201 Cumberland Avenue in West Lafayette. And also in the room uh, is Dorothy Moray, who uh, will assist Dr. Moray in some of the uh, historical information. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, both, excuse me. Okay, well, um, well, are you, are you going to ask me questions? Yeah, well, oh, yeah. yeah well, oh, all right. Why don't we talk about uh, uh, where you were born first and, and your family and uh, go on to uh, what inspired you uh, to uh, uh, go on the career path that you've done. Yeah. Well, both Dorothy and I were born and grew up in, in, in central Missouri. And I'm sure that background, uh, and I know this very positively, had a great influence on our career path. Uh, I was born in, and grew up in a, in a very small, almost a village, uh, in the uh, German settled part of, of Missouri near Herman. And uh, I was an only child. Uh, I was born and lived in a house that my father built about a block from uh, where he, about a block, about a half a mile from where he grew up. And my uh, companion growing up was primarily a series of dogs. And my playground was the surrounding forest. And both my father and mother were uh, school teachers and, and considered in the community to be to be intellectuals. They both spoke perfect English. They both knew uh, mathematics. They did calculations in their head. And, and when I and, uh, would have abhorred calculators, <laughs> had they, were they around now? And uh, were, were in many ways perfectionists. And, and um, I think this was a very, very good influence on me. Uh, they, my father especially instilled in me a, a love of nature, and uh, my mother uh, instilled in me a, a, a love of, of doing and, and, ha and having independent thought and problem solving. So by the time I was probably four or five years old, I, I was familiar with, with all the creatures in the forest and their, uh, their goings and comings and the birds and uh, with farm animals, and also uh, the, 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 the flowers and plants and the native trees, and uh, where was I? What a noise! What was that? I wish Jeff were here. And um, all, and I, I think very importantly, a love of gardening. My, I had my first garden when I was six years old. I got a package of seed from Henry Fields for a penny, <laughs> along with their order, and planted it. And, and I had a garden every year since. I've never missed a year having a vegetable garden. And I uh, was in 4-H, and my, my big 4-H project was, was, was vegetable gardening. And I didn't just garden, and I even tried to sell some of the produce that I, so I, that I raised excess. And I did experiments. I crossed tomatoes and uh, all kinds of made observations and took records, saved seeds. Uh, I could tell every vegetable, you know, from its seed and everything else and that sort of thing. And uh, probably drove my parents crazy. But uh, when I was, uh, I guess, a junior in high school, I, I won a contest and went to the National 4-H uh, Club Congress in Chicago as the state winner in, in gardening. 
vegetable gardening in 4-H, and that was quite an experience. That was my first time really away from home. Uh, I wanted to be, because I love trees and forests, and I wanted to be a farm forester, and, and I sat down with a farm forester in, in my little hometown uh, to, to talk about a career, and he says, don't do it. He said, it's a horrible life. <laughs> so I took him at his word, and then... And then I, he said, do something, do something uh, really intellectual, get a really good professional degree, like veterinary medicine. So I thought about being a veterinary medicine and uh, to go into veterinary medicine. And uh, in those days, uh, my view of veterinary medicine was slugging around in a muddy cow lot, uh, pulling uh, stillborn calves, and, and uh, I was unaware of that there was such a thing called veterinary research. So I wasn't real sure about that. But uh, one thing I was sure of, I was going to the University of Missouri. Uh, I had finished third in my graduating class in high school, and I had, was, had the top score in the, uh, in the entrance exams for the college. So I got a pretty decent scholarship based on that to go to the University of Missouri, and my parents didn't have much money. And I was going to have to work. Well, the summer after graduation from high school, now this is, the, this is all part, this is really the start of my career. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do that summer. Uh, I just hadn't thought about it. You know, I, I was struggling. I, it was such a uh, something that you know, you know to, to just, just to finish high school. You know, it was great. <laughs> high school was finished. And the first week after home, I was just sitting at home, sort of exhausted and relaxed. And down the driveway came a car, and inside the car was a county agent, a county extension agent. He got out of the car with a smile on his face, and he greeted me, and he says, uh, how'd you like to work at the university this summer? He says, I found you a job in the agronomy department in the weed investigations division. They're looking for somebody to work for the summer. And, uh, and, he, and he said, I've got a, a, a place where you can sleep in, a bar in somebody's basement and rent free, and all you have to do is get up and clean the house and cook the ladies breakfast. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, and I looked at my parents, they all had smiles on their face. I think they had set the whole dang thing up. But anyway, they gave their blessing, and the next day or so, I, I was in my little old uh, 1939 Plymouth uh, coupe, headed off for the University of Missouri, and uh, checked in an apartment, and the lady, she was, she was fussy, but she was a wonderful person, and she uh, let me go. And that was in uh, probably, well, it was, it was the year I graduated from high school, which was uh, 1952, I believe. Is that right? Three. Three, 1953. Yeah, I was about, I was, I was just approaching 16 years old. Because I had started school early. My mother was a teacher and she couldn't afford a babysitter, so she made me go to the first grade early. <laughs> so I was always the youngest person in my class. But anyway, uh, so there I was, and, uh, and it was in the agronomy department, or field crops at that time. And my first job was to, was to go spray some weeds out at the agronomy farm with 2,4-D. Now, 2,4-D is a herbicide that kills uh, broadleaf weeds, and, and, uh, and uh, so I did what I was told. I got the sprayer out and figured out how it worked and mixed up some stuff. and, and uh, drove the pickup truck out to the agronomy farms on a fence row and I sprayed the weeds and that was my first job and my first experiment. It was right alongside the road. So I did other things. I counted weeds and measured corn and, and uh, they were looking at corn herbicides, soybean herbicides, this sort of thing and, 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 and agronomic. And, and I, I was just in, I was in hog heaven. It was just wonderful. But, my, but what, really, what really impressed me was my first experiment. Because every day when I'd go out there, I'd stop and I'd look at these plants. Right? And I took notes on them. And they would, they would grow and they would writhe and they would swell and become abnormal. And then, of course, eventually they died. And I said, this is amazing stuff, this, this 2,4-D molecule. And it was, I looked it up and, and, and the structure of it is very small. And, it had been developed during World War uh, II as a, 
as a, 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 a tactical uh, substance to spray crops and just destroy it. It was a, a, the, the predecessor to Agent Orange, but it was much safer and, and not nearly as potent of the Vietnam War. And, uh, and I just became fascinated with it. And so in, in, the, in the evening, I, I'd go in the library and I'd read everything I could about 24D. And I ran across an article, and I wish I could remember who wrote it. I think it was a Professor Bandersky from Michigan State, but I can't be sure, on sort of a general article on 24D. And, and nobody knew how it worked in those days and knew what its target was. But the closing paragraph of his article, he says, if, you, if someone could understand how 2,4-D kills plants, that person could cure cancer. Now here I was, maybe 16 years old, going on 17, somewhere in there. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to understand how 2,4-D kills plants, and then I want to cure cancer. And I have never deviated from that goal my whole career. All right. So I did finished up at the University of Missouri. I started out, I gave up my plans to be a veterinarian. I decided I'd just go ahead and major in agronomy, and that turned out to be not very challenging. So with the help of some of the better scientific minds on campus, and a very, uh, a very uh, uh, caring and 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 uh, uh, helpful uh, patron uh, in in the field crops department. I, I took uh, courses like plant physiology, which were not in the curriculum. I took uh, organic chemistry for medical students. I took uh, physics. I took uh, uh, what was then called agricultural chemistry, which would now be biochemistry. I took every rigorous course I could get my hands on. I, I audited taxonomy because of my love for plants. And, uh, and uh, I had the opportunity to build a, a, a fairly good sized plant collection while I was there. And so weekends I'd be out botanizing and, the, and pressing plants and identifying them and became, became quite adept as, as, as a taxonomist. And uh, graduated in 19... 57, and uh, I was, uh, uh, I went to what was called a weed meeting, uh, where the uh, the uh, herbicide people went each year, and while I was there, uh, my, uh, as, a, as a senior, someone from Purdue walked up to me, and he says, I have an assistantship, graduate assistantship, and I've talked to your, your professor at at Missouri, this is the University of Missouri, where I was, uh, where I was uh, going for my BS degree, and he said, uh, "We'd like to have you. Would you be interested?" Of course, I was interested. And by the time we were already married, Dorothy and I, and we had what one child, no. yeah, no, on the way. But anyway, uh, so uh, so I graduated, and we uh, were living in a house trailer, and and uh, we hooked our house trailer to the back of the car, and came to Lafayette, Indiana, and and, uh, and set up housekeeping in a trailer park, which is now some sort of apartment complex, it's not far from, yeah. Yeah, where, yeah, where Payless is now located. And uh, I started my master's program here. And, uh, oh my God, it was, just, it was just the most marvelous thing in the world. I, I, I took every course I gave my hands on. I, I, I couldn't take them because I was in a master's program, but I audited every chem every biochemistry course that was offered in the biochemistry department. I just audited them. I went to class, took notes, took, you know, I, I w actually one of the, one of the most helpful uh, courses that I took in high school was shorthand. Now there were only two boys that ever took shorthand in, in high school. In my high school, I was one of them. My buddy was the other one, and we we still maintain contact with each other. We were both sort of intellectual types and. And that shorthand course and typing was the most most useful thing because I could take notes faster than anybody in my class. I could write down every word the professor said, and then I could read it back at the end. Sometimes I'd have to rewrite my notes, but but I could take take notes like crazy. So I, I audited all these courses and I took all these courses and and a, and a, 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 I was uh, I was uh, 
impressed by one of the plant physiologists, uh, Carl Leopold, who was uh, the, uh, a, a rel uh, I guess, a direct descendant of the Leopold of, of, of environmental bi biology, very famous Leopold. And uh, he said, you know, he says, it's, it's, it's not enough just to learn facts, but you have to uh, associate these facts with who, who generated them. So in all these exams, he, we had to read the original papers and we had to put down who did it and why and this sort of thing, you know, we had to know authors and who, who was the head of the lab and this kind of stuff. And I took him very seriously and, and, and finally managed to get an A out of his silly course. But, uh, but uh, and, and I was working on 2,4-D at the time. My master's thesis was on 2,4-D. And uh, uh, and I had to uh, I had uh, I'd been ROTC at the University of Missouri. So I had military training, and I was coming up. And so I took two years for my master's uh, because of the cycle of my, my ROTC cycle. And in and in my in my second year, uh, uh, my major professor, uh, 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 Professor Bruce Rogers, uh, came in my office, and he put a form, laid it on my desk. He said, fill it out, send it in. So I looked at it, and it was an application for graduate school at the California Institute of Technology. He had gotten his PhD there. And uh, my, my whole knowledge of California Institute of Technology was, was a book that I read when I was in the sixth grade in one of these little country schools that I went to. They had the whole Hardy book series. Hardy book, go there, Hardy boys, go here. And the one that I really, and I read it, I don't know, four or five times, was Hardy Boys Go to Caltech. It was absolutely fascinating. Was my whole, I, was, I knew what Caltech was, but it was because of the Hardy Boys. You know, isn't that amazing? So, so anyway, so I filled it out and sent it in. And, uh, and uh, sure enough, I had actually already been accepted because he had worked it out that, you know, that, that I was going to go to Caltech. It, all I had to do was fill out the paperwork. So we spent a, what was it, six months, an enjoyable six months or so at Fort Sill going through all this training. And uh, I'd really made a serious attempt to flunk out of ROTC, so I was pretty much, I, I, think, I think when they actually did the cutoff, I was at the, just above the line of those who would graduate as a second lieutenant, those who wouldn't, and I was very disappointed because I didn't want to really. But so anyway, uh, and I was the uh, uh, the Beetle Bailey of, of, of the University of Missouri class of 1955. But anyway, I, I I didn't have anything else to do, so I took it seriously, and I ended up at the top of my class. And uh, I uh, left uh, uh, Fort Sill. I was in the artillery as a first lieutenant, and I came back to the University of Missouri to gloat. I was going to look at my old uh, co uh, commander, you know, and say, you know. Hey, remember me, you know, bottom of the class, look at this, you know, and he had retired two weeks before I got here, so I had no chance to, 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 to ever meet him and see what his reaction was. One of life's great disappointments. But then uh, shortly thereafter, we, uh, we uh, loaded up our house trailer then and, and uh, headed for California. I thought of uh, Grapes of Wrath. Uh, <laughs> coming in and uh, coming in because we, we were, we're in Oklahoma, uh, Fort Sill Lawton, it was in Lawton, Oklahoma. So we were, we were, we were uh, uh, Okies going to California with our trailer and, and this sort of thing. And, and uh, we pulled into Pasadena late at night and, and uh, uh, on the last of December and the next day was New Year's Day. We got our trailer on blocks and the people in the trailer park says, How'd you like to go to the, to see the, see the Rose Parade? And uh, you know, well, heck, why not? You know, so we uh, so uh, we uh, got up real early the next morning and followed them on uh, in down in downtown Pasadena, where Caltech is located, and we sat along the street and watched the Rose Parade. And uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, saw all these movie stars and the and the Three Stooges and this sort of thing. And, and then we had to get ourselves home, and it turns out that uh, you know there's a lot of traffic, and, and we, they kept routing us out of our way. We didn't know where we were. It took us almost all afternoon to get home from that. But there I was at Caltech, and uh, I. Uh, it was a real challenge. It was nothing like nothing I ever expe experienced. It was just a tremendous challenge, 
everybody there was 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 top notch, first grade, and very demanding. And uh, weaknesses were not tolerated, and it was just an amazing experience. I'm forever grateful. Uh, and I, I'll, I'm I'm going to move on rather quickly fr from here, but. Uh, uh, I, again, I was working on, on basically on 2,4-D, but uh, more generally on, on uh, plant growth and the, the role of plant growth regulators like 2,4-D and other uh, plant growth regulators of oxygen type. That was my, t my thesis research, and I was just having a, having a great time. And uh, our daughter and son and second daughter? Third daughter. What? Depends on when you're talking about. Susie. <coughs> yeah, when? You were born out. You were born in California. Two. Yeah. Well, two were. Yeah, our first daughter was born in Lafayette, and so we had then three children at, at that point. And uh, on September of 1962, I believe it was, I got a phone call from uh, from Purdue University. My major professor had uh, left. To go to back to go Hawaii, because he didn't like Indiana. He wanted to get something like back like California. And would I take his position at Purdue? Would I replace him? And I said, Well, I'm not anywhere close to uh, to uh, finishing up. And they said, Well, we talked to your major professor. You go talk to him. You might have a chance. So all right. So as soon as I hung up the phone, I went up to see uh, James Bonner, who was my major professor, and, and he said, "Well, he said, uh, yeah, he said you might be able to." He said, how, "You know, how long for? Well, bye, bye, bye. You know, I, I hadn't done my languages or anything yet, and I, and I had started on my qualifying exams, but I had taken the biochemistry one, which is the most difficult, and I had done well enough on it that." To be, that could be could have been my major examination, although I had originally anticipated a plant physio I would major in plant physiology, but I ended up majoring in biochemistry. I got all my uh, qualifiers done. I had uh, 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 I did biophysics and uh, plant physiology as my other two. And uh, I remember that in that meeting I had with Bonner, he says, "How much are they offering you?" And I says ten thousand. He says, "D James." He says, "You're not worth ten thousand. <laughs> I take that job." Yeah. All right. So that was that settled it. <coughs> so uh, Dorothy typed my thesis, and, and uh, our oldest daughter helped. And, and I walk up and down the driveway, and and uh, and uh, Connie would would follow me. She shadowed me up and down the driveway. And she looked me. She says, "Daddy, I walk." Oh gosh, what support I had, and uh, so and so about July or August of that year, there was a, a, a lecture at University of California Riverside on the Golgi apparatus by a chap from the University of Texas, and it sounded interesting. And he was going to visit Caltech, so my lab mate and I drove over to Riverside that night to listen to this lecture, and it was on the Golgi apparatus. This guy showed these most beautiful electron microscope pictures of vesicles coming from structures within the cell, delivering material to the cell membrane, and all of a sudden the lights went on and I knew how cells grew. And so I, I said, all right, this is, the tar this is the target for 2,4-D. And I've got to figure out how to do this, and, and the only way we could easily either test this is to be able to isolate this cell component. So I talked to the to the guy afterwards, and he and I, I said I'd like he said I'd, I'd like to come to your lab and, and, and work, and and he said oh what would you like to do I'd like to ask oh we already done that and I said oh yeah, okay so he's going to be at Caltech the next day so I actually got to go to lunch with him and uh, talk to him a little bit mm -hmm. and that sort of thing so I said well can I come to your lab and learn how to isolate the gold jaffa and he said oh, all right I can do that all right so so. Uh, we got my thesis in and everything and passed the exam and then in September, I believe it was, of that year, we loaded up our, we sold our house trailer and we loaded up our belongings in a, in a U-Haul and we're off to the University of Texas at Austin. Now, I was so, I was so intent on isolating the Gozi apparatus that I had elected to actually do a postdoc at the University of Texas in lieu of taking this Purdue job. 
So I called up the head of the department. I said, I said, I'm really onto this great idea. I need to go to the University of Texas and learn how to isolate this, this cell organelle. Could I, you know, and I, I won't be able to make my September one day. Oh, yeah, don't worry about it. He said, uh, he said, we'll pay your salary and whatever else you need. He said, take as long, take as much time as you want. Your job will be here when you finish. All right, isn't that wonderful? So, so uh, there we were at the University of Texas, and we arrived in a, in a very hot Texas day with our trailer and the kids, the three kids in the car, and Dorothy, and, and uh, so I went into the building to, to look for the, the, the guy that I talked to, and, and he was nowhere to be found, and I finally found his administrative assistant, and, and, and I said, well, I'm here to isolate, to go learn how to isolate the gold jab rat, and she gave me this weird look, and she says, there's nobody here who knows how to isolate the gold jaff radius. Who'd you talk to? And I said, well, Dr. Whaley. Oh, he was just, he said, he, he, he doesn't know or something like that. And she said, I said, well, what am I going to do? And she said, well, she said, uh, tell you what, uh, uh, there may be one, one person who might be able to help you. And, and, and uh, she, said, she says, he's over and uh, has a laboratory underneath the greenhouse. And I'll take you over there and you can talk to him. So I went over and it was uh, Dr. Cunningham. And I told him my little story, and he says, no, he says, no, he says, no, he says, that, that's not true. I don't know where he got that idea. So he, uh, so I, I was devastated, and so I started to walk out and bump my head or something going out the, out of the basement there. And he said, wait, 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 wait. So I came back, and he went, there's a big stack of electromagrats. He pulled this one. He said, this is what he's talking about. He had one electromagrat where he had, I don't know, a, a gold apparatus is a stack of, Cisterna, and he had one isolated cisterna in, in one of his mitochondrial preparations. And he said, Dr. Whaley was excited about that because that showed that at least a part of the Gochabs could be isolated. So I said, oh no, oh God, you know, is that it? What am I gonna do? So he says, there's a, somebody you need to meet before you leave. He says, Dr. Molinar, he's the actual guy who took all those pictures, not Dr. Whaley. So he took me over to introduce me to Hilton Molinar, who was an electron microscopist, and he was sitting in a dark room working on his microscope. And I came in, and Bill, Bill Cunningham told me why I was there, and he came back. I just it's embedded in my mind. He kind of wheeled his way from back from behind the microscope, and he uh, pushed his chair away, and and he was fastidious, and he said, he wiped all the dust away from where he's going to put his hands down. Turn around, and he says, yeah, the gold jack says, We haven't done it, but he says, quite clear, it can be isolated. So he reached up on top of his microscope, and there was a stack of pictures, and he showed me one where, where he had broken, uh, uh, where, he, where a cell had been broken open, cut with a razor blade, and the gold jack was floating out. He said, there, that's all you need to do is just figure out a way to cut the cells with a razor blade, float them out, and you got it made. And I spent, oh my God, I don't know, I'm so sorry. I spent about four or five hours with him in the afternoon, just learning all I could about this, and all of a sudden I realized I had a wife and three kids out in the car. And, and uh, so, but then I said, well, I'm gonna stay and work with this guy. And uh, so I went out and told him I was very excited again. And, and the lady who helped us beginning was then became very helpful and, and she found us a, a house right on the spot that we could move into. It was somebody got a divorce and they didn't know what to do with their house and it was furnished and everything. And so we went to this house and pulled our trailer into the garage and didn't even unload it. We <laughs> put the kids in bed, Ed got something to eat and, and we were up and running. So we were there for three months and we did isolate the gold jam brandish from plants and, and it was absolutely amazing. And that was actually the first about the first half of my career at Purdue. Uh, Dr. Molinar and I published a book in, um, it was published in 08, uh, called The Goji Apparatus, The First 100 Years, in which we chronicled all our discoveries in the isolation. We eventually isolated it from animals and developed a bunch of very important concepts in the membrane system and related it to growth and, in fact, uh, directly or indirectly uh, was able to prove that yes indeed the Golgi apparatus in plants was a target of 2,4-D because it did have the 2,4-D receptor in it. So 
half right. Okay, the the second half of my career uh, started in the in the late seventies, I guess, uh, and uh, with the publication of the Golgi apparatus book, we essentially stopped doing uh, any more work on the Golgi apparatus. And uh, we had uh, had done from the very beginning, coming up to do, uh, trying to trying to uh, pinpoint the site of two four D of two four D action. And uh, we published a, a couple of papers with Charles Bracker in about 1976 that unequivocally demonstrated that the target, the primary target, now the Golgi was a secondary target, the primary target was was at the cell surface, at the cell membrane, the plasma membrane. And so uh, my next project was to learn how to isolate the plasma membrane from plants and then eventually from animals. So we became experts on plasma membrane isolations and we published the first, the first method to do this and uh, had, uh, had a lot of implication, a lot of impact on, on plant physiology to be able to do that. So here we were with the, with the, with, with confronted with uh, what, what, what is the, the, the 2,4-D target. And uh, I came to Purdue in... 62. October in, 62. In, uh, December yeah, 1962. In, uh, yeah, in December 1962, yeah. And uh, I took a sabbatical in 1969 at the University of Paris to work on a plasma membrane isolation in, in, in animal cells. And uh, in 1976, uh, uh, we were, I, was, uh, I became interested, still in, had this interest in cancer. So we spent a sabbatical at the German Cancer Center in Heidelberg in 1976, both Dorothy and I. And uh, I, and I was at that time was in the botany department. And it was very difficult to do. So I, I had to I had to learn to do so. We needed a cell culture lab. I had to have a cell culture lab. And there's no way I could get that in the in the botany department. So I joined forces with uh, the Dr. Heinz Floss in medicinal chemistry and said, "We need a cancer center for people like me who have need cell culture, but we can't get it within our department." So we proceeded to put together a cancer center, and uh, in uh, uh, we got funding from the National Cancer Institute. And in uh, 1976, I became the first director of the Purdue Cancer Center. I was the director for 10 years from 1976 to 1986. And one of the services that we provided to the university was a cell culture laboratory for cancer research, and there were others, other, others of course. And. Uh, we, we, I continued to work on plants, trying to uh, find this, 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 this mysterious 2,4-D target. And uh, uh, together with Fred Crane in the biology department, uh, we developed a, uh, a, uh, a concept uh, of uh, plasma membrane electron transport. Which has, which was important to growth. We didn't know exactly how. So, but we knew that somehow the 2,4-D was affecting some component of electron of the electron transport chain, and that it was something to do with NADH, uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is a primary reducing substance in the cell, primary source of energy for for uh, metabolism, uh, used to make ATP, and uh, but we just couldn't get a handle on it. And we tried. All sorts of combinations with, with various acceptors and donors and back and forth and back and forth and nothing responded to 2,4-D. Uh, about that time, I was appointed a charge de coeur in the University of Geneva uh, to spend a few months a year at the University of Missouri, Geneva in Switzerland working with students. And uh, I continued to work with the 2,4-D stuff there on plants. And one, uh, one uh, noon, we were at a little cafe uh, not far from the university building where I was, <laughs> having lunch with a group of colleagues. And I was discussing this problem, how frustrating it was. And they said, have you tried ascorbic acid? I said, no. 
We should try ascorbic acid. It's something that's on the outside of the cell. It should interact with the cell surface. It's an ideal, it'll be an ideal donor for, for, for your enzyme. So we just dropped everything. We had made some plasma membranes that afternoon or that morning for another experiment. We took those. We found some NADH in a desiccator somewhere. We rigged up a spectrophotometer. I had some 2,4-D with me. We put it together, and sure enough, the 2,4-D stimulated. Now, it took us a couple of weeks to realize that ascorbic acid had nothing to do with it. The stimulation was just without nothing, and the enzyme that we were looking for was an NADH oxidase. No donor, no nothing. It was a terminal oxidase of plasma membrane electron transport. And that then set the tone for the next, uh, well, for, for, for a very long period of time because now we, we knew where it was. We immediately found it in uh, cancer cells. And uh, there was a very distinct difference between the one in cancer cells and one in normal cells. The normal cell one was highly regulated. It required growth factors and hormones to be, uh, to be active and the cancer one didn't. The cancer one was its constitutionally activated and immediately became obvious that it was responsible for the unregulated growth that characterizes cancer cells. So we were off and running. Uh, I was appointed professor in 1985. Um, The, uh, I think, again, uh, about 1972 or 73 or 74, somewhere in there, I had, I had the uh, dream of, 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 of doing a litmus paper test for cancer. I mean, that would be ideal. You could just take somebody's saliva or blood or something, dip a strip in it, see whether they have cancer or not. And uh, I thought, well, you know, that's an impossible dream. But when we discovered, when we finally identified the protein, uh, uh, it was uh, amazing uh, that and the cell surface, so that it all all cell surface proteins are shed. So it was it it would it, it turned up in the blood and, and later on in, in in also in urine, and so there there it was. So there was the basis, would be the basis for, for, for the litmus paper test, that it was actually shed from the cancer cells into the, and it was absolutely cancer specific. It was nowhere in, on any normal cell or tissue or anything of this sort. But er, and every cancer we looked at, because now we could look at sera, we could look at sera from hundreds of patients and look for this protein, and it was everywhere. Every cancer, leukemias, lymphomas, everything had it. We were working with Lilly on some of their anti-cancer drugs at the time. And we did received a lot of support from Lilly. I mean, mostly just technical support rather than money. And uh, I had, I had, uh, I think only one grant to work on this ever. Uh, and it was it was one of the highest scores I ever got. And uh, there were some problems, mainly with colleagues, that. They, they thought this was too good to be true. And I know there was some, some monkey business going on. I can't prove it. I don't even want to bring it up too much. But when I went for my renewal grant, I sent it in. And I got a one-sentence review. And the review was, there is no such thing as a universal cancer marker. Therefore, the proposal must be flawed. And it was totally, and, and I've never gotten a grant since. And it was, it was, it was out of the, completely out of the box. Um, I, uh, <coughs> I, I started a company, uh, or a company was started actually out in California called Oncogene to try to uh, commercialize this as a diagnostic and uh, became Portola Sciences. And uh, one of our advisors was uh, George Todaro, the discoverer of uh, cancer viruses. And he named the protein, uh, uh, TNOX, these NADH oxidases were called NOXs, and later on ectonoxes. 
and he said, it's Tenox and Tenox. Tenox is an herbal and Tenox is, a, and, and he got very excited about this and he, and he thought we should, uh, you know, we should uh, go with it. And so he was, he formed his own company to sort of get a jump on it. So he said, well, nobody will ever believe this until you clone it. So, uh, all right. So uh, I went back then we had to clone the darn thing. And in order to clone it, we had to isolate it. And so one of Dorothy's students, a, a PJ Chu, worked very hard and, and isolated the protein from, from serum cancer patients. We got quite a, quite, a, quite a good bit of it. But we couldn't, we couldn't degrade it, we couldn't sequence it, we couldn't do anything with it. It was just indestructible. And, and we sent a whole bunch of protein to uh, Todaro and he, he couldn't, he, and they ran it on a column or something like this and, and, uh, and uh, accused me of sending them water and, and uh, I actually went out there and I said, can I see the trace? And yeah, here and there it was, the trace, and it was just a big peak right at the end. I said, there it is, what happened to it when they went into the sink? And uh, um, so that was, so that was very, so that was very, uh, very, uh, uh, very, dis very disgusting. So I came back, and then toward the, to basically Todaro pulled out at that point, and uh, Portola Sciences uh, was disbanded. And about three years later, uh, we started because we couldn't do conventional cloning; we had to do expression cloning, which is much, much, much more difficult. And uh, and uh, again with Dr. Shu. And she was able to uh, make an antibody to the protein. It was a beautiful antibody, very specific. It didn't react with anything else. With that antibody, then we could, we could recognize which colonies, bacterial colonies, had the gene. And that's what expression is cloning. So we used the antibody in expression cloning, and, and we got it and, and uh, published it in uh, about 1986, maybe, 70, no, before that. 1982 probably, and uh, <coughs> and so we were we were moving again. We had actually identified an ant an entity in the cancer cell that was responsible, but there was no there was no normal homolog for it. It was, it was a single gene, and uh, but we had the antibody. Now, antibodies are made by hybridoma cells, and hybridoma cells are fusions between normal cells and cancer cells. And um, these are monoclonal antibodies are made, or are produced by, by hybridoma cells, which are fusions between cancer cells and normal cells. Now this antibody that we had was, was growth inhibitory, and it inhibited the, the growth of the hybridoma, because the hybridoma has, was half cancer and half normal. So we couldn't produce the antibody because as soon as the culture started, hybridoma culture started producing the antibody, it, it died because it was self self destructive. So uh, I had read about a technique called uh, um, single chain recombinant antibodies, where you where you rescue the the, the uh, rescue the RNA. To make the, that the antibody RNA, and then you you express it and, and uh, use use a heavy chain, light chain, and link them together and, and make an artificial antibody. So we had just barely made it. We had just enough of the cells that we were able to isolate the RNA, and it took us about three or four years to make the construct a construct that would produce an antibody that was a potency equal to the original antibody. So, but that we could produce it in bacteria. The bacteria didn't have TNOX, or, or the, we call it ENOX2 now. So it wasn't affected by it. So, it, you know, you just grow, it just grew and grew and grew and grew, and then we could do experiments where we'd take the antibody and give it to cancer cells, and they would be knocked out. So we'd, ah, immunotherapy. But uh, as we'll see in a moment, that didn't work out either. So, uh, so we were sort of, sort of on our way, I guess, of, of having a, an assay for cancer. And uh, we had this monoclonal antibody and uh, had no grant money. 
So uh, there was a group, of, uh, so uh, there was a, a compound that was supposed to be a panacea for cancer. It was produced by an Australian, com uh, yeah, by an Australian company. And uh, I looked at it and I said, now this, this compound should inhibit the, the ENOX too. So I contacted the, uh, the lead investigator and he agreed with me and he invited me to a meeting in the East somewhere of a handful of investigators that were working on this substance called phenoxidile. And he sent me a small sample of phenoxidile. Sure enough, it inhibited the NADH oxidase. So I went to this meeting and gave a paper on the uh, phenoxidile as a target for, uh, or ENOX2 as a, or TNOX as a, a drug target for phenoxidile. And they were impressed as hell. And they said, well, you know, something this important deserves to be developed. So they put together a group of investigators and, and came to Research Park out here and set up a company called Knox Technologies. And earlier, maybe five years earlier, the university had abandoned all our, all our patents and stuff because they didn't, there was no way that it was ever going to be implemented. In fact, nobody believed it. And so they turned, so they, they, we had a turn back agreement. We had, I don't know, it was a half, almost a dozen maybe patents in this area that had been turned back to us by the university. So in exchange for the turn back technology and our expertise, we got 20% of the company. And they were set up in the building down the street, the uh, BTC building, and we had a small lab and we hired some personnel and staff and, and uh, we were dodging around conflict of interest and this sort of thing, but managing somehow. And uh, long about that time, uh, uh, in Dorothy's lab, uh, there was a discovery made of an aging-related NOx protein called ARNOx that was responsible for oxidation of lipoprotein particles. And so uh, we started to study that out here. I mean, that was it basically for a little while took a backseat to the cancer work. The cancer work was kind of stalled. We just didn't know what to do yet. And uh, so we, we were able to develop a, uh, some nutraceutical inhibitors of this ARNOX. And uh, we got a, uh, 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 and we licensed that to New Skin, which is a, a cosmetic company, anti-aging, and they developed an, an anti-aging strategy called AgeLock and became fabulously wealthy from it. And uh, we got really some substantial royalties and the royalties paid for the operation of the company. And uh, um, so we were going along and everything was fine. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, Purdue said this, <laughs> this should be ours. <laughs> and Doc Sells and Sanji said, no, this isn't yours. Here's the paper trail. And what I had done is actually I had a series of of uh, what are called research services agreements with the university, which, uh, yeah, not, uh, New Skin gave the university money to do research, but one of the clauses of anything that came out of this belonged to New Skin and not to the university. So I just kept feeding them data, you know, and I thought I was perfectly, perfectly okay with the university thought otherwise. So uh, you know, to uh, make a long story short, I basically we had a we had a choice of either giving up the company or giving up the university, and that didn't take, that wasn't a very difficult decision at that point. So we came out <laughs> here then full time in what, 2009. Somewhere along the line, I should mention that I became a, a distinguished, in 1986, I became a distinguished professor of medicinal chemistry. I also transferred over from, um, from the uh, botany department to uh, the biology department for a while, uh, so I could be director of the Cancer Center. They didn't want a botany professor being the director of the Purdue Cancer Center. So that change was in about 1976, and then, in 19, and then I went from from the biology department after several years to a professor of medicinal chemistry. And in 1986, I became the Dow Distinguished Professor. 
And in 209, uh, that's when we made the move, and, and uh, so at, at that point, I, uh, we both became emeritus professors. And the uh, anti-aging stuff was, was, very, was, was very successful and making a, a, a lot of money, and, and uh, uh, the investors were impatient, so they, they decided to sell Knox Technologies to New Skin. And we had a clause in the in the in our contract that, was, that if the company was ever sold or disbanded or went bankrupt, the cancer technology would come back to us because we still wanted to pursue that. And sure enough, it was sold, and and uh, the the our part of the sale we d invested back in uh, to create what is now more Nuco or more Moray's new company. This is interesting because we had we had all this paperwork and agreements and stuff and we didn't have a name and if we had to call it something, we just called it Moray's new company, Moray's new company. So when we had to come up with a name, we said, well, there it is, Moray's new company, more Nuco. And uh, so more Nuco was, was, was uh, and we, we took over all the equipment from Knox Technologies and all the staff and everything. In fact, when we left the university, all our staff came with us. We still have most of the most of the staff, my secretary, and everybody's still out here. That we when, when we left the university, they all came with us. And uh, so uh, so here we were, and uh, and we had to do something to to break the deadlock. And. Uh, we decided, well, let's try let, let's try a two-dimensional gel electrophoresis and see if we had this antibody. The antibody didn't work in an ELISA. This is very strange because most antibodies do, and we put our originally when we were with Knock Technology, we put all our money on an ELISA, and we 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 developed I don't know maybe a dozen different antibodies, and none of them would ever work in an ELISA. And again, there was great skepticism, and, and the people, uh, the investors said, no, this is all fictitious, it's a trap, it's not gonna work. We don't want them to work on this cancer stuff anymore. So when we got rid of those investors, then we, we went back to it. And, and it turns out that what happens in the body is that uh, as soon as you get cancer, you make, you make autoantibodies to the Enox2 protein. And so all the Enox protein are, are combined already with autoantibody. It's a kind of protection to the to the to the to the Enox two, and so it's it's protected from degrading, and it also totally eliminates any possibility for immunotherapy or an ELISA because the antibody combining sites are already tied up with natural occurring antibody. Now, if we do. Uh, if we do um, isoelectric focusing, we can put the we can get the autoantibody somewhere else and the antibody here, and take this and elute the antibody, and then it will react with the Enox2 antibody. But that's a long, laborious process, and and we we uh, couldn't see that. So we said, well, let's try two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. We'll do isoelectric focusing, one dimension separated from the autoantibody, and then do gel electrophoresis in the other dimension and see if we can see spots with our antibody by Western blotting. Voila, spots. And uh, we had a, 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 our daughter uh, made an arrangement to get us some leftover blood samples from uh, uh, a Mishawaka uh, from a, a cancer uh, uh, clinic in Mishawaka. Uh, she was in South Bend. And uh, what they'd done at the end of the day, they'd whatever Serum sample, they did. They just combine them because at that time, cancer was cancer, you know. So we took that sample and we had we had something like twenty five different spots, not just one, had twenty five different spots showing up. And immediately I said, my gosh, I said, I bet every cancer has a separate spot. So then we took lung cancer, we took breast cancer, we took every cancer, and sure enough, every cancer has a Separate spot that differs from every other cancer in terms of some molecular weight and isoelectric point. So now, not only could we diagnose cancer, but we could determine organ site, tissue of origin, and that is the basis for what we are now commercializing out here. It's called the Oncoblot test. So people send in serum samples, doctors from all over the world. 
and we do 2D, 2D gel electrophoresis on them. We see what spots light up with our recombinant antibody. And you have cancer or you don't. And it's very sensitive and very specific. And we not, not only know what sort of cancer they have, but it's also the organ site. And before we even let something let's go, we had to have we had to have an intervention um, so that people could do something about it. So you just didn't panic. And I can't remember when this started. It was in the '60s, I guess. There was a uh, Dorsey's department uh, got a grant for a botanical center at Purdue, and she was part of it, and I got to be part of it. And our project was to look at green tea. And it turns out that we developed a nutraceutical called Capsule T because it's, it's a green tea concentrated trait uh, and a, 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 a chili a pepper a powder, a chili powder, chili pepper powder, uh, which is synergistic and they, they're both ENOX2 inhibitors and very effective and very safe. And we call it Capsule T. And uh, that is now commercially available. Uh, for people, and we just uh, published a clinical trial, uh, an extensive clinical trial last year, that with very early cancer, where you get a positive alkablot with no uh, clinical symptoms. You take the capsule T uh, every four hours for three to six months, and the uh, Enox2 protein goes away and presumably their cancer is gone. And that's what it looks like. We've had no recurrences in any of these people. So we know, so we have uh, early detection and early intervention. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a very lovely package. Uh, here's one other, one other little thing that I wanted to add here before, uh, before we wound this down. Uh, Can you remember, can you think of anything else? I, I should, that's pretty much the story. Um, so the, uh, oh, yeah, fantastic. So uh, while we were, while we were out here, uh, we had a very talented uh, intern. We had, we had interns, instead of graduate students, we had interns from the university through the interns for Indiana program. Fantastic students. And uh, one of them was, was able to uh, uh, expression clone the, uh, the, the uh, 2,4-D, uh, the ENOX2 protein that reacts with 2,4-D. So we have the, the 2,4-D receptor cloned, identified, and nailed. And my, the thought that I had when I was a 16-year-old, freshly graduated high school student, and Professor Bandersky, bless his soul, if that's who it was, who had the idea that if you could figure out how 2,4-D killed plants, you could cure cancer, it was absolutely right. Well, thank you very much for... It's a long history. No, it's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, we will conclude this uh, uh, conversation uh, and... Uh, then uh, we'll, we'll start on part two. Fine, good. Okay, uh, this is uh, David Hovde, and uh, it is uh, June 24th, 2014. Uh, this is part two of the Dr. Uh, D. James Moray's interview uh, at... Uh, 1201 Cumberland Avenue in West Lafayette uh, and uh, Dorothy Moray is also here uh, in the room and uh, now again we will uh, continue this uh, interview with uh, part two. Okay, I just wanted to add that uh, this saga of, of discovery being all the way, all the way back to high school has actually been uh, recorded in a book uh, published by Springer, uh, co-authored uh, by myself and, and, and Dorothy Murray. It's called
called Ectonox Proteins. It has 500 and uh, over 500 pages. And uh, everything is uh, fully documented, including uh, or original research, uh, references to original work. What? And, and it's published in 2013, yeah. So that's, uh, that's a very, it was a very important omission. Uh, a couple of other things I forgot to mention. Uh, uh, between the two of us, we have uh, between 700 and 800 peer-reviewed uh, uh, publications. And uh, to our credit, and continue to publish uh, two or three papers a year uh, in peer-reviewed journals and reviews. And uh, we've just uh, had a, a paper go on the press on uh, on uh, um, uh, the uh, the Knox proteins are periodic in there. They 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 oscillate. Their activity oscillates, and we've traced these oscillations to uh, a property of water involving disequilibrium between ortho and para spin pairs. And uh, this is also a revolutionary uh, concept of, of great interest uh, to, uh, to physicists. Uh, did a bit of teaching along the way. Uh, my uh, first teaching was uh, with uh, Uh, cell biology uh, in the biology department, and uh, I taught that uh, uh, in 1968 and 1969, and then uh, between 1969 and uh, 1973, I, I taught various uh, classes uh, relative to membranes, uh, special problems courses, uh, a, a series in environmental pathology, and uh, uh, was responsible for a biomembrane seminar. Uh, when I uh, transferred over to medicinal chemistry in uh, 1975, I taught uh, nature of cancer uh, course for uh, between 1979 and 1999 and also uh, taught biochemistry to pharmacy students during that same period. And, uh, uh, and a uh, elective course, MedChem 401, uh, called The Nature of Cancer, which is very popular, where we brought in uh, speakers from uh, all over the United States to talk to uh, um, to help do health uh, pre-professionals about cancer, and then, uh, but uh, I think my favorite course was, of course, teaching teaching uh, uh, biochemistry, and uh, I finally got the knack of it <laughs> in about 2005, and and that year I had an overall course rating of 4.6 on a scale of one to five, and that was very gratifying because. I, the, the philosophy I took was that every every pharmacy student who was smart enough that they could get an A in the course is they just apply themselves. And so that my objective was to not water down the course, but to inspire the students that everyone got an A. And I I think that that year I've actually managed to uh, to get about uh, 80 to 85 percent of the students uh, with A's uh, simply by motivating them. Uh, I've had some citations for most cited papers in the field. Early on, uh, one of our articles on the Golgi apparatus was among the t 10 most cited papers in the field. Um, 1978, I was among the 300 most cited authors in science based on author data between 61 and 76. And I uh, have a number of citation uh, classics. and. Uh, Interestingly, and this is largely through uh, all the work that we did with the Cancer Center, building grants and this sort of thing. In 2006, I was in the 95th percentile in the distribution of extra, extramural NIH grants over the last 25 years. So I brought a tremendous amount of money into the university through, primarily through the Cancer Center. 
And as far as teaching is concerned, uh, I mentioned very on that I, I, I became interested in taxonomy. I think in the fourth grade, my fourth grade teacher introduced me to Latin names of plants. And uh, I began to learn them uh, very early in my career. And by the time I was through at the University of Missouri, I was a, I, I just knew a lot of plants. And, and uh, I had my own system for plant identification. And uh, when I came to Purdue, then as assistant professor, the uh, taxonomist had left for California, had gone to the University of California, Davis. They had nobody to teach plant identification or plant taxonomy. So guess who taught plant taxonomy? <laughs> this biochemist cell biologist. It was great fun, and I actually wrote a book. My first book was called Plant Identification Using Plant Characteristics. And uh, it was published as a result of these efforts, and, and it's still being used uh, several places in the United States as a, as a, as a text. It's a very it's a very simple system and it's great for students of agriculture and people who who need to identify plants but are going to be spared uh, uh, counting uh, counting uncountable hairs on stamens or something like that. Okay, that's is there anything else you think I should add? No. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, we. Uh, are continuing part three of our conversation with uh, Dr. D. James Moray, um, and it is uh, uh, June 24th, 2014, and uh, at uh, 1201 Cumberland Avenue in West Lafayette, and I would appreciate it if the other individuals in the room would introduce themselves. My name is Jeff Moray. I am the son of Dr. Moray. Yeah, I'm Dorothy Moray and the wife of um, D. James. Uh, Jeff is here from uh, Corvallis uh, this week. So. Uh, Dr. Moray, uh, one of the things that uh, is, uh, I was interested uh, me uh, is is uh, Purdue. Uh, uh, faculty and staff who have a, a strong uh, interests in uh, working in various ways in the community and, and helping with various community events and so on like that and uh, definitely you have a, a long history in uh, doing that and I will let you tell your story and it has connections with your family background I believe mm -hmm. and um, and it's uh, been going on for uh, several decades. Right, several recall. generations, yeah. So, uh, and it def definitely also has a connection with uh, Purdue University's uh, uh, curriculum in the past. And with that, I will uh, let you uh, continue with this conversation. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I come by blacksmithing, I guess, uh, uh, naturally. I, it probably is possibly even genetic. Uh, my uh, grandfather was a farmer blacksmith in the little town of, the little hamlet of Drake, Missouri, where I grew up. And uh, my father uh, was the youngest of three sons of, of Henry Moray. Moray and uh, he, uh, when he was 16 years old, he was um, indentured to his father as an apprentice for a five-year apprenticeship so that when he became 21 years old, he would take over the blacksmithing part of their, of their business. That would be his, then he would be the, the, the new blacksmith and replacing his father. And he did that. I mean, he actually worked for five years as an apprentice to his father, and, and he had paperwork and everything. It was all, it was really an, 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 an a, uh, indentured apprenticeship. But during that five years, it became very apparent to my father that blacksmithing, in at least rural blacksmithing, was, uh, was a, uh, a dying profession. The only work that he would have probably at continuing on was shooting of horses and mules and uh, 
that even that was fading fast and he'd eventually be out of a job. So he made a, a, a I would say a remarkable decision for someone in his social status and, and position. On his 21st birthday, when he became a free man, he walked the 20 yards from his home on the old iron road to the old iron road and hitched a ride 60 miles uh, to the east, across the Missouri River to a little town called Warrington, where there was an academy. <clears throat> and at this academy, <clears throat> It was run by the Methodist Church, but at this academy he could get a, a, a high school education and a, a college education simultaneously. He had no money, so he worked and he cut hair and he cleaned garbage cans and he cooked and <clears throat> did everything he could and, and uh, uh, to, uh, to, to get by and, and he, he got his degree and he even tried a year in, in the ministry. But that didn't suit him as well because <coughs> his real love was, was, was teaching. <coughs> and he came back to the community where, uh, where he grew up and uh, married my mother who was a minister's daughter. And uh, they lived in a tin shed for a year or so while he tore down an old store building and built the house where I was born. And it was about a mile from the blacksmith shop that he had indentured in and that his father had worked in, which was now closed. There was no, there was no blacksmith anymore in Drake. So that's where I grew up. And uh, my father had a weakness for blacksmiths. And uh, when anything broke, he wouldn't take it to a, to a real mechanic. He'd always take it to the blacksmith and see if he could get the blacksmith to fix it for him. And, uh, something metal, of course. And uh, <clears throat> I was intrigued by this. I'd go I'd go along and I'd stand there in the doorway in, in the darkened shop and watch the sparks and watch them work. And he'd always be right up there at the end while directing traffic. And every once in a while he'd grab the hammer from the blacksmith and do it himself because the blacksmith wasn't doing it right. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, there was a, 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 and then they'd always do a little dance at the end which is absolutely fantastic. I call it the blacksmith shuffle because they'd stand there, you know, and they'd, neither one looking the other one in the eye. And, and <clears throat> my dad would say, oh, how much owe you? Oh, I don't know. And they'd shuffle their feet in the dust, you know, and look down. Ah, I don't want much to it. You did most of it yourself. And uh, you, you had your own arm. I didn't have to use any own. I had a little bit of coal. You know, and, and, oh, come on. He said, well, maybe a quarter. That was always the standard price for the, the quarter. This will become important later on in the interview. So I remember those, those days. And <clears throat> nothing much happened. I was not, I mean, I was interested in the shop was there. As a kid, I'd go down there once in a while and poke around and see what was, what was left in the shop. There wasn't much left anymore, except for the anvil and a few, a few tools, the, the uh, ring cone miner had been stolen a long time ago. But the forge and the blower, everything was intact. And uh, for what reasons which I will never fathom, when I was about 14, 15 years old, my father decided he wanted a farm. We had about 40 acres associated with the house, the house where, where I was born. And uh, he wanted a farm, that 40 acres, like he did when he was a boy. And uh, he wanted to do it. Not me, he wanted to do it. So uh, we went out and we bought a team of horses and he got kicked by a mule and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. And we bought harness and and, uh, and uh, <coughs> we bought some old, uh, this was, uh, well, this was in, uh, when I graduated from high school in 53, so it's about probably 50, 50, 51, maybe 50, 51. <coughs> and, uh, <clears throat> it was in the summertime now. You, of course, you know when you taught school, you, your summers were free, and and so that those were interesting summers because, uh, I mean, we we went down and, and fitted the shoes for the horses, and he nailed them on, and I watched him, and and uh, we built a hay rake 
uh, we went down to a, 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 a guy, a wheelwright, about 10 miles away, and he had a barn loft just full of everything you could ever imagine for making hub spokes and fellows and got all that stuff to build the wheels for the hay rake, get some old teeth, and my dad made the wood and everything, and we put the wheels together and and uh, <coughs> and uh, took down, went down to blacksmith shop, built the uh, the tires, the, the metal tires, and, and got them right. And so then we we're going to put the tires on the wheel. So this is typically my father. He we, we we went back up to the house and in the front yard, he got a bunch of shavings and uh, and and uh, shingles and stuff like that, and he made a circle right in the middle of the front yard. Then he got some gasoline and put it all down with gasoline. And then he put the tire down. And he never never talked. I just watched. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. And uh, and he got two or three big buckets of water and set them down there. So he put the tire down in the midst of all of that, lit it, <laughs> the fire went all the way around, and heated up the tire. And at some point, he handed me a pair of tongs and and. Uh, uh, he took a pair of tongs and we, we lifted the fire, the wheel out of the fire, and we dropped it down in the grass. And then he took the buckets of water and, and no, and we dropped it over the over the wheel, the wood part. Then he poured the water around, and that old wheel just went crunch. You know, the, the metal had expanded and shrunk up on those tires, on those wheels. And that hay rake lasted for I don't know, like five or ten years. And those wheels, those wheels never got never got loose. You know, they never ever had to re replace them. So he did all of this, and we pointed a plow, and oh goodness, everything uh, sharpened the plowshare, and not we, he did. I always watched him. I mean, the only thing that I ever got to do was drill the holes for the for the tires on the hay, on the hay rake using a post drill that they had down there. You crank with the crank. That's about the only thing I ever got to do by myself. But I watched him, and so then uh, what? I guess it was pretty close to my, maybe even my senior year. Uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, then I went off to university, and of course he kind of lost interest then, and he was tired of plowing through bumblebees' nests and having the horses run through the fence and this kind of stuff. So he sold the horses and bought a little, little tractor and sold the, sold the tongues off all the horse drawing equipment. And, Fixed it up so he could pull it with a tractor, and that was the end of that. Never understood why he did it. Okay, skipping ahead to 1963. Uh, the Marais came to West Lafayette, Indiana, <coughs> at uh, the assistant professor at Purdue University, and sort of settled into the community and um, that was fine and uh, then we, we had, I think we had, we went on sabbatical, our first <coughs> sabbatical was in 1970 or 1969. And I think when we came back from sabbatical, it was either 1969 or 1970 that uh, Dorothy was looking at the newspaper and she says there's something out at Fort Wyatnam this afternoon, it was on a Sunday afternoon, called the Feast of the Hunter's Moon. She said, it might be nice to go out, let the kids run. So we went out and they had, a, they, it was a very modest thing. There were maybe a few few craftsmen and they had a, cooked a pot of beans and made a bunch of cornbread and everybody was worried because the health department was gonna shut them down because they had didn't have a permit. And, uh, and the kids had a, did, they just ran and ran and ran, they had a marvelous time. And uh, I was looking around, and there was a uh, one, uh, one of the few craftspersons out there was a, a university student in a military uniform. He had set up a little uh, little uh, forge, a little uh, rivet forge, and, and an anvil, and had a piece of three eighths inch rod or something like that. And he was going with a hammer, and he was going pick, 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 and he he didn't and he pick, 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 and he didn't a rope around it on four, on four posts, and that was it. I don't know if he even had a shelter on uh, over him. So I went over and watched him. And 
I didn't know what he was doing. But I knew he was doing it all wrong. <laughs> I knew he was doing it all wrong. So I finally says, what are you making? He said, I'm making a, a trigger guard for my long gun. I said, oh, I said, you need some help? Oh, yeah, he said, I don't know. So I stepped over the rope, <laughs> helped him, and we fiddled around. I, I, finally, Dorothy had to come and said, we just got to go home. So uh, I always say I stepped over the rope and never stepped back because uh, the next year we got a phone call in January, February, and said uh, somebody saw you out there working with the blacksmith and, and uh, he's not coming back. Would you be willing to do be the blacksmith at the Peace Hunters Moon this year? And I said, good heavens, yes. <laughs> Sounds like fun. So, so basically that next year, I guess it was either 1970 or 1971, now this is about the second or the third year of the feast, because I think the feast started in, this is the 45th feast, so they started in uh, uh, 68, I, in, uh, I guess in, what would that be, uh, 68 I guess it started. So I was either in the first or second year that we, that we actually started. And I don't remember much of that first feast that we went out. It was basically the same sort of arrangement, cornbread and beans, and I had a, I had about the same sort of arrangement, a rope, and I had the same forge and the same anvil as him, and, and I had found a few tools and this sort of thing, and, and, and that's, that, was a, that was a feast. I think maybe it was only, I think maybe it was only a one-day feast. I'm not sure about this. It had just been on Sunday. And, uh, so all of a sudden, this I, 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 interest in blacksmithing was kindled. So uh, very shortly thereafter, uh, I, I, the, the historical society called and says there's a uh, group out at uh, oh darn uh, yeah. what no 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 uh, uh, where the where the uh, when you go out towards Attica, uh, where uh, um, where where uh, where Odell, Odell, yeah, Odell. So we had Odell had a had a uh, bellows that was in a stagecoach stop out there, blacksmith shop at a stagecoach stop, and they it was up in a barn, and they wondered if the historical society would be interested in it, and all oh, mouse eating and everything. So Dorothy and I went out and got the bellows and <coughs> set it up in our garage and we put leather in it and got it all restored and functional and put, re replaced everything that moved and didn't move. And so very shortly thereafter, we set up a, a bellows and a rock forge uh, with a little thing around it, and, and uh, <coughs> which was an improvement. And uh, in... Uh, 1973, or 1974, I think 1973, uh, we, uh, I proposed to the Historical Society that we build a permanent shop to house the bellows. And they agreed, and we put up the money for it, and we got a, 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 a contractor to use rough sawn lumber and everything, and build it with, and put shake, that had a shake shingle roof, and. And I found a forge at uh, from Williamsport. It was a forge from the blacksmith shop in Williamsport that had been, the building had been torn down and the forge was sort of laying there in ruins, but most of it was still there and the brick was still there and it was brick that had been uh, kilned in the area, uh, maybe up at Longusport. I'm not sure where the kiln was located. That's the nearest kiln that I can, but there was a pretty good brick industry in this area at that time. And so uh, I got a truck from the Historical Society and hauled that forge in and, uh, and built it. And then my father came and uh, the two of us built a chimney. I couldn't do a straight chimney, but he could. He was a very good bricklayer. So that's how we got the forge and then we installed it. And, we had a, and the building was constructed so the whole front would raise up with posts so it looked like a 
back of a shop with a with a shade, and people could see what was going on inside. So that's been the way it's been for the feast ever since. And we've done every feast every every feast since that first time I stepped over the rope, and, and we've evolved. But we haven't evolved much beyond that the permanent shop. The uh, anvil in there was bought from Nerns in Boswell for $60 in 1974. It was still the same anvil, and we've still been using it over and over. It's a wonderful old anvil. And uh, the, the first feasts were, were fantastic. I mean, just absolutely fantastic. They were, you just can't imagine. It was just, it was just a thrill. I couldn't wait. I mean, the whole, my whole life, if, the, if, if, if I would, if I would been granted a Nobel Prize and the Nobel Prize presentation would have coincided with the Feast of Honor's Moon, I'd turn them down. <laughs> because it was just wonderful because in the early days, everybody was on the, was on the blockhouse side of the road. The Indians, and we had real Indians in those days, the military people were camped down along by the river and the, the artisans were, were out in the, in the area and, and everything was, and they'd march up for the opening ceremony just up the hill and march back down to their tents. And the whole time of the feast, we, we spent making things for people that needed them. We had military people lined up. They wanted this, they wanted that, they wanted a, they wanted a poker for their fire, they wanted a, something that, to, roast their, to uh, roast their pig on, they wanted spits, they wanted this, and we were just busy the whole time. And, and oh, a couple dollars and this sort of thing. And, uh, and uh, all, we just made, all we made sure is that we got, we got enough money at the end of the feast to buy new iron for the next year and, and to buy coal. And it wasn't until uh, 19, 1977 that we actually set up a booth and made stuff in advance. We made Essex and stuff. And we, that year we took in $207.10, which we then donated to Historical Society. That was our first. And we've had sales ever since then. We were, we, we've made the stuff up during the year. and. and uh, and we had a group of we had on blacksmiths, Tom Johnson, Carl Delaney, uh, and uh, and then of course, of course Jeff has a had a, a son Jeff, uh, and would you know was 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 a blacksmith and uh, he uh, is now a master smith. He has his own uh, operation out in Oregon, and. Uh, you know, that's wonderful, and, and uh, he's got all the equipment he needs to, to blacksmith, and, and he's carried, carried on the tradition, comes back. I think he's been back for damn near every feast. Close. Yeah, yeah, every, every, every feast, and he's been there. And then he's, he, he's been recently, has been, has a, has a little leather, has a little bellows type, and he sort of reconstructs our early uh, thing down in one corner. He builds a rock forge, and, and this is basically what it would have looked like at, during the time of the feast. Now it's or at the time of the Fort Riot now. Now it's very important that the, that there be a blacksmith at the feast because uh, that the blacksmith was the first tradesman that came to Fort Riot in the fur trading days. The garrison at Fort Riot had requested a, a priest, a blacksmith, a uh, something like a cordwainer or something like that, a couple of different craftsmen, and uh, the. Uh, uh, People in Montreal, whoever sent things down, they sent them a, a blacksmith and, and, and four soldiers. But anyway, they got their blacksmith. So there was a blacksmith, and there actually there there are uh, in the digs. There's still evidence of, 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 of uh, that there was a blacksmith working at Fort Vietnam in the various very earliest days. So it was very important to have to have a blacksmith, but it it it, it evolved and and. Uh, uh, Somewhere around in, in the mid 70s, uh, we had we had uh, uh, we'd have maybe <laughs> ten or twelve people that were, were, would be a couple of master smiths, uh, the uh, Wolf uh, uh, Longcore, Mike Longcore, for example, was one of the master smiths that would come out and work there every year, and, uh, and a, a professor from the agronomy department. Uh, and uh, uh, more recently, uh, 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 well, anyway, a lot, lot of Purdue faculty uh, would be involved, and apprentices and 
kids and everything, and then all our grandsons eventually became would come to the feast, and they they'd forage and and, uh, and granddaughters, one, as well. granddaughters as well, mm -hmm. right? And uh, one of our grandsons uh, is now a master smith. He has his own sh shop and everything, and he's absolutely confident. And what does it take to become a master smith? What is and who well, there, determines there, you are? Yeah, there are three, well, it, it, there are three stages. I mean, it, traditionally, there are three stages of, of, of being a blacksmith. The first stage is, is, is as apprentice, is a, as an apprentice. As an apprentice, you, 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 uh, you, you do whatever, you, whatever you're told to do around the shop and clean up and carry coal and water and, and, and you learn the basics. And and uh, and if you have the aptitude and the interest, and you can find a place, uh, then uh, you 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 leave where you apprenticed, and you go to another shop, and you basically volunteer. You're called a journeyman. And traditionally, the the, the test was when it, somebody came in and says, "I'd like to," do you have a position for a journeyman? Uh, the first test would be to make a hammer from scratch, punch the eye and everything, that sort of thing. And if the hammer looked good and the hammer looked serviceable and it held up, then you, you got the position. If you made a crappy hammer, they would splay out before the day was over, you know, he didn't get the job. So they did work as a journeyman. And they received, I guess, a small wage. And. And you work for as long you work for a journeyman as long as you had to to get enough money, and to find a find a position is very similar to to what was the guild system in, in in Europe at that time. You know there were just there were a limited number of spots for blacksmiths, and only the best would survive and the most determined. And sometimes they'd be twenty thirty years old before they actually. Uh, could become a master smith, and basically, what to become a master smith, you had to have your own equipment, you had to have your own anvil, you had to have your own forge, you had to have your own shop, your own tools, and you had to be independent. And that's sort of the criteria that we, we use now. That uh, between being an apprentice and being a master smith, you work as a journeyman. Tom Johnson <coughs> is, is, is a journeyman, still is a journeyman, for example, because he's never set up his own shop, and uh, and he doesn't mind. And he enjoys it, and it is a special privilege in, in that in that case. And uh, some of our grandsons would be considered still as journeymen. They have they have their own hammers and they have their own aprons and stuff like that. They, but they don't have their own backyard shops or they don't have a place to to work. Granddaughters. So I think Jeff would tell us some of the things that he's made. I mean, he he doesn't make just straight blacksmith things. Very artistic. Well, so okay. I, so well, one of the things, though, I, I I've been told about the bench out front of the shop at mm -hmm. Fort Wyatt. Now, yeah. That's uh, special to your family, is it not? The what? The bench that sits out front. Is that where your did your father hold court there? Or? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, he did. He came for a number of feasts before he died, for, uh, and uh, he uh, and he would sit there and talk to people, and he made some knives one year and was selling them, and and. Uh, and uh, and uh, the first weld, the first like the first forge weld that was made out there, he did it. He showed me how to forge weld, mm -hmm. and uh, which is which is very very interesting. Now I'm going I'm to go back this a little bit, and I'm going to do a series of, a series of vignettes and things. I want to get back to this idea of, of the, the first feasts of how of how everything was everything was integrated, and, and we made stuff for the people out there that really that really wanted it. We had very few tourists. It was just wonderful. It was just wonderful, and and uh, uh, the uh, the uh, director of the uh, the museum director was Bill Ball, and Bill was 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 just a bundle of energy and a real character, and he and he was the feast. He was the heart and soul of the feast, and he had a, he had this vision, and there was a, a Lee uh, Bob. Bob Lee was 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 the sort of the the organizer of everything, and he he borrowed a big truck from Henry Poor, and he and they'd go out in the woods and they'd cut all the wood, 
and they'd bring in corn stalks, I think, or, 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 or willow branches. I can't remember what we used to what we used to do, and they, they built they built booths for people. And there was no plastic involved or anything. They just built four poles from the woods and stuck them in the ground, and mostly did them with post hole diggers. And and uh, uh, Bob Lee would be out there, and we'd, a month before the feast, everybody would be out there working away, building the shelters and everything, and and uh, and uh, we'd be working in the blacksmith shop. And if anybody needed anything, we'd fix it for them and or, or build it for them. And it was just it was just a, it was like a community. And and uh, so you have all the shelters built up, and then. And the the the, uh, the and there would be uh, the, the Indians in those days were, were used wigwams, even though that wasn't typical to the Indians of the of the Wea, of the Weas. But they had wigwams, and the wigwams would be just across from the blacksmith shop down in there in that area. And I can remember going out there very early, on a on a Saturday, I'd say a Saturday morning of the, or a Sunday morning of the feast. And there'd be a mist, playing over that valley, by the, by the fort. And you could, and people would bring their dogs. That was fine. Pets were allowed, and they'd have their, they'd have their, their, their fires going, and the smoke would be coming out of the teepees, and the dogs would be barking, and there would be voices, and it was like being transcended back a hundred years. You could actually feel your heritage. You could feel what had, what had been there. In the fourth dimension probably still retained. It just it was just it was just a, a, a transcending experience to do that, to come in early in the morning when people were getting up and cooking their breakfast and, and messing around with the with the with the teepees in the in the background. Gradually that gradually that, that has changed <coughs> and I think not necessarily for the better, but uh, things evolve. Uh, if it rained, we got wet, and so somebody got the bright idea that we'd put plastic over the over the shelters. So now all the shelters have plastic, and we still tried to cover up for a few years, put corn stalks or something on top of the plastic. That got to be too much bother. So now we just have plastic. So all these shelters, which used to be absolutely rustic, are, are now just plastic um, covered things. And we, the military got moved across the road way back on the other side, and, and it's, it's too far to get over anymore. And most of them sort of got their own blacksmiths and this sort of thing, or they'd work with some of the commercial blacksmiths that were a little bit closer to them. So we have almost no contact anymore with the military. But the only thing we sell to the military, well, we sell mostly to the Boy Scouts or Strikers and Spence and Strikers. We only the only booth that sells flint for strikers, and we usually run out of flint after the first day and run out of strikers at by noon. And uh, so we mostly just deal with tourists. And a lot of the townspeople who supported the feast in the early days maybe went faithfully for five, ten years, and then just stopped coming. So we see very few, very few of the early of the early people uh, anymore. And uh, it's 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 I'd say become commercial. In the beginning, there was no admission charge. People came and went, and it was great. You could bring your family out, and, and people did. They came. It was like the you know you build it and they'll come, and they did. And this was Bill Baugh's dream to have this, and then. Again, uh, you know, they started charging admission and more and more and more and more, and because it turned out that the, I guess if I if I if I understand correctly, historical societies basically being financed by the was being financed almost totally by the feast, and uh, at record attendance, you know, in the early days, and attendance dropped and the, as the prices went up and. And the authenticity sort of disappeared, and the bigger it got, the smaller it got to be an sort of actual fact. But you know, people still come in costume, and it's wonderful. Uh, it's still a wonderful experience. 
uh, this will, this com upcoming one if, will probably be my last feast, and, and, I, and I hope that there will be uh, some people, some people to take it over. Uh, one of the things that, that I think that came out of this was uh, I began to collect tools, and we built an extension onto our house in, 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 on Cherry Lane in West Lafayette so I could have a blacksmith shop at home, and I have an attic and I had an attic full of blacksmith tools, and I went to auctions all summer long and stopped at every antique shop I drove by and bought hundreds of tongs and everything. And, and I also started to research from trial and error and what I could read and talking to blacksmiths how to do things. And uh, I, I started in 1979 producing uh, about 20 page uh, Xerox how to do books. Uh, just the, how to lay out the shop and how to build a bellows and all this sort of stuff and welding and so forth and so on. And I did one of these a year for uh, uh, about 10, 12 years, 14 years, and we sold them for a dollar a piece. People would come, they'd get their book, you know, and they had, and I've seen already if people have these notebooks now with all these little things in it. And in, uh, in the mid-90s or something like that, I, I, we, we put them all together and, and, uh, and uh, into a, a book called Blacksmithing for Beginners. And uh, I had ended up doing all the artwork myself because I tried to get some professional artists to do it, and they couldn't get the hang of it. You know, they thought what I was doing and it, would, it didn't make any sense to me. So I ended up doing all the, uh, all the narrative and all the dog, it was a hell of a work. I mean, it really was a, a labor of love. And it was published in 1996, and uh, then we started, and then since then we've sold that. And it was, uh, it was been sold by Centaur Forge Company as, uh, on their website and uh, their catalog. and sold out in California and, and on sale out at the Battleground, the now Profits Town. So about uh, two years, three years, four years ago, I guess, I, I had all this equipment and stuff, and and uh, I thought, thought to myself, and Dorothy and I had many, 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 and also with Jeff, many, many discussions about this, what's going to happen to it. And if I didn't, if we didn't do something, uh, one day there'd be an auction, and this once in a lifetime collection would be dispersed. So uh, we got the idea that we'd build a blacksmith museum, and Jeff, for a time, wanted to do it out in Oregon. There was a problem with that. I think you had one location picked, and it fell through. And, and we thought about maybe putting it in Drake, where, where the original shop was, and. That wasn't going to work out because there's just a matter of security. That community there, after about three weeks, somebody would saw the end off the building and haul everything away. And then uh, Prophetstown State Park was created here, and that seemed to be a good venue. So we talked to uh, Driz Abraham, the farm director, and I said, Driz, could we put up a blacksmith museum out there? So uh, we took some of the money that we got from the sale of Knox Technologies, which was our company at that time, it was sold to Newskin, and invested it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a building, which would be the Blacksmith Museum at Prophetstown State Park. And with the help of uh, grandsons, we moved the equipment in and, and, and grand wife, grand wife mm -hmm. <laughs> Dorothy and, and everybody else. And, and we re recreated the, the same forge that's out at Fort Vietnam using some of the original brick. We also used some of the brick from the Monon uh, Freight Depot that I'd collected, so it was original brick from the area. And, uh, and uh, build it up, basically, and uh, I was able to uh, secure my grandfather's anvil, my grandfather's anvil, and that's out there now. And. Uh, on Saturday, the 28th of this month, we're going to dedicate the blacksmith shop, sort of, and all the grandkids and kids and great-grandkids and everybody are going to be there for that. 
and we're going to have everybody make an S hook on grandfather's and great grandfather's or great great grandfather's anvil, and we'll add those to our to our displays out there. But basically, it's going to be six generations on the same anvil. And there's a little, I don't know, like genetic or what, but it's just the, the love. Well, <coughs> I, my mother's family was very artistic and very musically uh, uh, inclined. Uh, one of my cousins was a, was a, a ba prima ballet, uh, prima, what do you call it? Principal ballet at uh, Salt Lake City. And cousin was a, was first chair violinist in the symphony orchestra, and and, and, and then my my uncle was, was a fantastic artist, pianist, musician, composer, and her mother was a fantastic artist and this sort of stuff. And so we have all these artistic scenes, but I, I can't I can't paint, I can't uh, I don't do very well on the keyboard, I, mean, I sing a little, but blacksmithing it's an art, and all the art all my artistic scenes come out. With, with a hammer and a hot iron, and Jeff has, has, is a musician. I mean, he's, he's carried some of that forward. He's his own group now. But still, too, I think he finds the artistic. And I don't know, you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, what you, what you make and why you make it? <laughs> do, you, do you have time for all this? Or um, you seem like you're I'm supposed to focus on you. Yeah, right, right. You're supposed to focus on me. What now? So, um, Focus on you. Oh, me. oh, all right. Okay, sorry. I'm I sorry. think one of the most, one of the most. I'm gonna butt in, but okay. Uh, okay. One thing he didn't really tell you is he mentioned it, but is is the recovery of m my grandfather's anvil. That's always fascinated me that they were able to track it down. Let's say I think it was sold to maybe three or four different people, and they somehow my uncle Charlie tracked it all down and they I remember driving with him to Jefferson City, Missouri, going to this residential neighborhood and buying it from this guy out of his garage. Yeah. And his grandfather's anvil, here it was. You know, it probably changed hands three or four times and somehow they And bring it back to Lafayette in the front seat of the car with my with, 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 <laughs> with my feet on top of it. No, this this is a really wonderful story. I, I uh, my when when the when the when, uh, well, my grandfather died, and, and his wife, his second wife or third wife, whatever it was, uh, who I didn't know very well, but was the only grandparent that I even had ever had ever met. I had met my grandfather once. Uh, he was uh, he was uh, only lived about a mile away, but he never came to visit and this sort of thing. And, and uh, one crisp fall evening about sun, sun, sundown I went um, he was bringing a load of corn across the field up above our house and my dad had some business with him so he said you know and I was this little guy so he we walked up there and flagged him down and they talked I, I don't know if they, were, they spoke German I think maybe he was speaking in German and my grandfather looked down and he says is, is this der Jona? and my uh, Father, yeah, that's this is their young. He said, oh, good. So he, 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 he gave, gave you know, a geschenk. He took a ear of corn off his wagon and threw it down to me. That's the only gift I ever got from my grandfather. It's the only time I ever really remember meeting him because a couple of months later he died, and, and I remember being at the funeral and my father crying. I said, that, you know, that wasn't good. But so the anvil was there for many, many years, and uh, and then they had an auction. Well. Nobody wanted anvils in those days. They were mainly scrap. So, and my dad wouldn't let the thing go to a scrap dealer. So he bought the anvil, and then he bought whatever tools there were left. And and he brought the tools home, and he threw them down by the side of the barn, and used the anvil for a little while. And and then uh, he was. This was during that period when uh, during a period when he was trying to farm, <coughs> like he did when he was a kid. And and. Uh, uh, one of the pieces of equipment that he built to be pulled by the horses was a drag. And, you, uh, and this was to break up clods and make a nice seed bed. And he needed weight on the drag, so he put this anvil on the drag to weight it down. That was the last. Uh, and uh, so that's the last time I remember seeing it. 
So when I got interested in blacksmithing out at, out at Fort Wyotnon, uh, the not the first thing, but after a couple of years, I said, I'm going I'm to, let's get Grandpa's animal and, and Grandpa's tools. So I went back to my father and I says, where are all the tools? And he said, well, I buried them down there, or I put them down there by the barn and they got buried under this. I spent the whole afternoon digging those tools out of the mud and cleaning them up. And then I said, well, what happened to the anvil? And he says, well, I sold it. He said, you sold it? Yeah. Who'd you sell it to? He said, I sold it to a tie cutter because there was a lot of timber in that area and a lot of people that um, uh, split, cut down trees for railroad ties. And one of the tie cutters had bought it from him. And he said, well, I wasn't using it. just sitting there on the drag, you know. And he wanted an animal, so I sold it to him. All right. I said, do you know his name? Nope. you know anything about him? Nope. Said, I think he was from Jefferson City, which is uh, the state capital, not too far away. But well, Jefferson City is a pretty big place. So uh, we were just getting ready, ready to go back and my dad was sitting in the living room in the chair and I was sitting in the dining room there was getting putting stuff together and he says, Pax. I said, and I, I, I said, Pax, Latin for peace. I thought he was just giving me a reading of he was an intellectual so he knew stuff like that. He was surprised that I did. But anyway, no, 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 not Pax. Bax. That's the name of the guy who bought the animal. So I immediately got on the phone. I called, as you said, uh, my brother-in-law in Jefferson City. He was in a he was in a, 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 a local policeman at that time, and he's he knew everybody and everything that was going on. And I says, is there a is there anybody is there a tie cutter anywhere around Jefferson City by the last name of Bax? Yeah, the woods is full of them. <laughs> There's several of them. So, I, so he said, I'll get on the radio or something like that and figure out which one has the animal. Sure enough, about an hour later, he, he located it. And it was a Bax that had it still, had it in his garage. So I, I, so I called up this guy, and, and, and it was Saturday night. We were coming back the next day. And, and he, he was at a tavern. And so I got the name of the tavern, and I called the tavern, and I said, could I speak to Bax, whatever his name was? So he got on the phone, and he had, he had a little bit to drink, and he, I said, you know, I told him who I was and what I wanted and why I wanted it and everything. He said, he said oh, uh, I don't know. He said, I always wanted an animal. He said, heck, I hadn't had it in that garage. He said, he's nothing. He says, I guess you could have it, but you're going to have to pay for it. And I said, that'll be fine, whatever you want. Just tell me what you want. He said, I'm not taking a dollar less than $50 for it. Because <laughs> I, I think he'd sold it, my, my dad sold it to him for 20 or something like that. So I breathed a sigh of relief. I was thinking 500 you know. I would have done that. He just was a no problem. So, so then the rest of the story you heard from Jeff. We, we, we went down to uh, Jefferson City and find him and got the animal, put it in the car and brought it back. <laughs> You're going to have to pay for it. All right. <laughs> 50 bucks. <laughs> so, uh, so then, uh, so it's, it, it's there and it's, it's up Peter Wright. It's probably, uh, probably uh, my great grandfather, I don't know whether he bought it new or used in around uh, uh, 1890 or so. And uh, the tools out at the Backley Museum all represent the period of the, around between 1890 and 1920, which is the period of the farm out there. They're all authentic. They're all authentic to that period. There's practically nothing there that, 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 that's not, not authentic. It's an amazing collection. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Our pleasure. I don't know. Hopefully you go visit the museum and see what Absolutely. it's like. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. One of the uh, one of the uh, aspects of, of blacksmithing out at We Ought Not, which I neglected to mention until now, is is is, is the teaching. Uh, there's for as long as I can remember, there, there's always been a blacksmith class out there in the summer. 
And the original class was, was taught by uh, uh, McDowell. And uh, he he was a he was a blacksmith who had retired and and uh, and uh, and every summer he well we'd be out there working and then he'd have his little class out there and and uh, one of the things they'd do is every student that took his class would would make a link for a chain and he had he had this very long chain for all of his students and uh, it was always su such a joy and and a lot of the a lot of the McDowell students would then c come and work with us during the feast. He was a very good teacher. And he died from cancer in 1981. I remember the last time he was out there, he was he was almost totally immobile. He, he couldn't do anything, but he supervised the last links going into his chain. And uh, so there, there we were. Uh, with with no, with no class, so uh, uh, Tom Johnson, Robert Burbig, and I and a couple of other people picked up the class. Then and I think probably 1982 or so. So now every year since then, sometime around the feast or during the middle of the summer, we've had a blacksmith class for, uh, and uh, the, the people who complete it get us a, 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 a apprentice certificate. And all our kids have done. The, you took the class, didn't you? You have a printed certificate. You never took the class, darn you! You did. I know you did. You took the class. Yeah, and uh, uh, and all the grandkids have taken it, and they all have their printed certificates. And I don't know whether the great grandkids are are going to be able to do it or not. But maybe there will be a class that they can take. And uh, so that was so that's been a very uh, I think a very important. Uh, uh, um, Component of, of blacksmithing out there, so that we've always have a fresh supply of apprentices and and keep the uh, keep the craft going uh, uh, through 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 teaching. Thank you very much.